This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Merry Christmas. Welcome to our worship. We are glad that you are here. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, gather us in from the busyness of a Christmas season and help us focus on you and you alone in this hour. We praise you. We adore you. We give you great thanks for this gift of Jesus Christ for your incarnation, for your coming down to us, and for your remaining with us, even in this hour. Lord, we confess that we do not always live lives worthy of your calling. We ask your forgiveness. We ask that you be present with us now, that you reveal your word to us, that you hear our worship. For we pray it in the name of Christ. Amen. Once again, good morning, Merry Christmas, and welcome to online worship with the First Presbyterian Church of Hamilton Square. We are so glad that you are worshiping along with us this Christmas season. We want to let you know about some changes that are coming to our online worship. Beginning on Sunday, January 2nd, we'll be live streaming our worship that takes place here in the sanctuary. And what that means is, is that for those of you who worship online with us, the time of our online worship will change from 9 in the morning to 10 in the morning. It also means that the worship service will look a bit different. It will be the service that we have here in person. And so we invite you to join us for online worship uh, at 10 o'clock 
on Sunday, January 2nd. That will be the new time for our online worship. Let's continue our worship now. Well, Merry Christmas. I want to invite all the kids to come on up around the screen and we'll share a bit of special time together. I have a candy cane in my hand. You probably have had lots of these this Christmas season. I wonder if there's something about Christmas that this candy cane might be able to tell us. So let's, let's take a look here. Well, if we flip it this way, it looks an awful lot like the letter J, doesn't it? We might have to use our imaginations a little bit, but this looks like the letter J, and that reminds us about Jesus, because Christmas is all about Jesus. We celebrate that he was born on Christmas, and we celebrate what that means for us, that God comes to us in the person of Jesus. And if we flip it this way, it looks a bit like a shepherd's crook. Well, that reminds us about the shepherds who came to worship Jesus, and to, they were so amazed at the good news that Jesus had been born. And that reminds us that Jesus is good news, that his birth is good news for us. Well, and what color is this? This is red and white, isn't it? And that red color, well, if we think about that and we remember other stories about Jesus, then that reminds us that Jesus' story doesn't end in the barn with him in a manger, but that he grows up and that he eventually ends up dying on a cross for you and for me. And that's good news for us too, because he forgives our sins and in that we are made friends with God again. There's a lot we can learn about Christmas from a candy cane. So the next time you eat one of these, remember about Christmas. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for Jesus. Help me to believe in him. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, this week I have a birthday coming up, and I know that I must be getting older because I'm about to give my mother the greatest gift that a son can give his mother. I know Christmas was just yesterday, but I promise when she gets this gift, it's so good she won't even mind that it's a day late. I want to say in front of God and all of you, my mom was right. Now, I haven't gotten a chance to call her yet and to tell her the good news, but mom, if you're watching this online service, you, your ears are not deceiving you. You heard it. I said it. You were right. Every year on Christmas morning, my family would take turns opening all of our presents, and then when we were done and we had dug ourselves out of a mountain of wrapping paper, we were immediately faced with a dilemma. What do you do with all the new toys? Well, being the type of person who thrives in order and organization, sometime between brunch and dinner, I would begin to put all of my new things away. But my mom always stopped me and told me to put everything back underneath the tree. In her words, she wanted to be able to look at everything. And so for the next few days, all of the presents would sit under the tree, unwrapped, so that everyone could see. And as I thought about our passage for this morning, I realized my mom was on to something by insisting that we look at our Christmas presents. You know, we spend months preparing for Christmas. We count down the shopping days. We get the just the right family photo for the Christmas card. We make our lists and we check them twice. And as soon as Christmas Day comes and goes, it's time to tear everything down and to put it all back away. But our passage for this morning from the book of Hebrews, once again, calls our attention 
to the miracle of Christmas. So let's listen now to God's word from the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, God has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. Well, the book of Hebrews takes the form of a sermon written to a group of Christians in Rome who had grown discouraged. They were jaded. They were weary. They're enduring persecution and suffering for their beliefs. Families are being separated. Friends are being fed to the lions in front of enormous crowds in the Colosseum. And in the face of all of that struggle and hardship, this small branch of followers seems to be wondering if this whole Jesus business is really worth it anymore. I wonder if that's how we feel about Christmas sometimes. It's in the hustle and the bustle of the preparations. We expect that this year is going to be the perfect Christmas. Our expectations build and build and build so that they top out somewhere around near-Earth orbit. This is going to be the year that everyone gets exactly what's on their list. This is the year the whole family is going to get along, that the dinner conversation will be engaging and pleasant. The turkey is going to be brown and juicy. This will be the year that the sting of absent loved ones finally fades into the background. But then as you're taking down the tree and putting the wreaths back in the basement to wait for next year. Do you do it with a tinge of disappointment and a muttered, well, maybe next year will be different? Do you find yourself asking, what difference does Christmas really make? Does anything really change because of what happened in a Bethlehem stable 2,000 years ago? Well, the Hebrews were in need of a new vision, just like we are, and this passage from the opening of the book of Hebrews serves to lift their sights higher than they even dare to hope into the cosmic sphere of what God has done. In one breathtaking paragraph, and actually, if you could read this in the original languages, it's actually one sentence the writer of Hebrews refocuses our sights on the all-encompassing dimensions of the Christmas story. We cannot imagine a Christ too large to fit the story that Hebrews tells us. He is the supreme, definitive, final answer spoken to a humanity desperately in need of answers. Just listen to how sweeping and all-encompassing the Jesus of the book of Hebrews is. He bookends history as the one through whom God created all things and who God promises will inherit all things. He radiates the Father's glory into the world that he made. In everything that he does, he expresses the very character of God. He sustains everything in the universe, from the most distant black holes to the chemical impulses in your brain, allowing you to see and to hear right now, this very second. And he does it all by the mighty power of his command. He is the one who made this world defiled by sin clean once again. He has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and he sits at God's right hand. 
That's a resume that not even the angels can top. If we were ever in any danger of imagining that Christ just occupied some corner of our existence over there somewhere, well, then this passage for this morning informs us that we must be thinking of something else. The writer of the book of Hebrews will not let our imaginations remain impoverished by a Jesus that is too small. Now, let's be honest for just a second here. It is really tempting to want to have a small Jesus, one that remains in diapers, as it were, and and never leaves Bethlehem. It's tempting to have a small Jesus that we can find to just one portion of our lives. It's really easy to make Christmas anything and everything instead of the Jesus we read about in Hebrews. But when we reduce Christmas down to the celebration of the birth of a small Jesus who occupies just a cobweb-filled corner of our souls, it's a bit like giving a child a really cool present. And then once they open it, they don't really care about the present, they just play with the box. When we do that, all we do is make Christmas manageable. And the Christmas story of Hebrews is absolutely not manageable. The miracle of Christmas, according to this passage, is that this powerful Christ who sits enthroned at the right hand of Almighty God, who is superior to the angels, breaks into human history and becomes just like us so that we might be reunited with the God that made us and loves us. The miracle of Christmas is that the God who sustains every aspect of creation through his word is the same God who understands our weakness because he experienced it firsthand. The same one who sits at the right hand of God is the same one who was willing to, to die for us so that we might have new life. The miracle of Christmas, according to this passage, is that because Jesus is the heir of all things, our lives are not meaningless, but that we are crowned with dignity and honor as Jesus' prized possession. One theologian puts it this way, the idea that Jesus is the heir of all things addresses the human need to know where life is ultimately headed. Does the one who ends up with the most toys or the most troops really win? Does history flicker out with a whimper? Do the rich keep getting richer and do the violent always bear it away? World without end, amen. This passage assures us that when all is said and done, life does not belong to the demagogue, to the oppressor, the tyrant, or the warrior. It belongs to Jesus Christ. Creation does not disintegrate in violence, chaos, and futility. It endures as a holy inheritance. Human beings do not end up in meaninglessness. They end up as the treasure of the beloved son. See, Hebrews reminds us that if we were ever in doubt about whether Christmas really matters, all we need to do is go back and look again at the story of Christmas with fresh eyes as if for the very first time. It tells us that a new vision will come as we understand more and more the cosmic implications of the arrival of God as a baby boy sleeping in a feeding trough. To our questions about whether Christmas makes any difference muttered as we try to coil Christmas lights so that they won't become a tangled knot for next year, the book of Hebrews simply points at Jesus and answers with a resounding, you bet it does.
But that yes comes with two implicit questions attached. Will we live our lives as though this passage were really true? And if we were to live our lives as though this passage were true, then how would our lives be different? Would we be more patient with ourselves and with other people if we believed that in Jesus Christ we had really been made pure? Would we finally release ourselves from the demands of perfectionism and receive the acceptance of an embrace of the ones who made us pure? Would we be more patient with other people because if we acknowledge that they too were that they too were a person that Jesus had purified from the stain of sin? Would we be less fearful and anxious if we really lived as though it were true that The God who created everything actually sustains all things through the mighty power of his command. Would we finally feel free to live wholly for the benefit of others without thoughts of self-preservation nagging at us? Would we be less suspicious of God's goodness, feel less like God was holding out on us if we believed that the glory of God was most completely revealed as God emptied himself and became powerless so that we might rise up to the glory of new life in Christ. See, friends, if you find yourself wondering whether Christmas really makes a difference, if you find yourself in need of a new vision for what your life could be, then perhaps we ought to keep all the unwrapped presents under the tree so that we can look at them just a little bit more. Perhaps we ought to hold off on packing up the Christmas decorations for just a bit and return our sights to the majestic, grand, cosmic story of Christmas. Friends, let's pray. Gracious God, fix our sights once again, on the miracle and majesty of Christmas. Convince us once again that what happened in a stable in Bethlehem so long ago still matters today. Change us by what happened there. Change our lives so that we might live as your people, It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh,
As we come to a time of prayer, my prayer this morning will be guided by the words of St. Augustine, by a prayer that he wrote once, and a great giant of the church whose words can teach us and help us in our own prayer, even today. Please pray with me. We rejoice in you, God our Savior. And we rejoice for the great thing you have done in your Son, Jesus Christ, who became incarnate, who is Emmanuel, God with us. And we all rejoice. The sinner rejoices, for their righteousness has been born. The oppressed rejoice, for their liberator has been born. The sick rejoice, for their healer has come. Those who suffer from injustice rejoice, for their justice has come. The hungry rejoice, for their food has been born. Those who seek rejoice, for the one who finds them has come. And we, your church, rejoice. For the one who calls us into service, who calls us into ministry, who is our head, our authority, but whose spirit also works in and through all that we do, your church rejoices. For the Christ child has been born. For this we give you thanks and pray together the prayer that he would later teach us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Take another look at Christmas. If you're ever in doubt whether Christmas matters, just look again at what God has done. And remember to join us for worship at 10 o'clock on Sunday the 2nd, whether it's in person here in the sanctuary or online for our live stream worship. Now, may the God of Christmas, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Friends, go in God's peace. Thank you.